Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Dewsbury Evangelical Church's morning worship services. We gather as we do every Sunday in the name of our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We come to worship Him. And it's a great thing we can do that. We can do that through the reading of His Word. We can do that through prayer. We can do that through the preaching of His Word. We can do that through singing. And we can do that even after the, the formal end of the service as we continue and eat together uh, with, uh, in fellowship lunch. Let, let me read some of God's words uh, to get us going. Some wonderful words in 1 John chapter 4 where John says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world, that we might live through This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a burning sacrifice for our sin. And there's lots of beautiful truths in that passage, but let me just bring two out to help us as we then sing. The first is God is love. God is love. In his very essence, he is love. And the second thing is God showed his love through sending his son to die on the cross for our sins. With those two truths in mind, let us sing, shall we? Love divine, all loves excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down, fix in us your humble dwelling, all your faithful mercies crown. If you're able and willing, join me in standing to worship our God.
Let's pray to our triune God together. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come to you as Father, as a result of Christ's death on the cross for us, as a result of the Spirit in us, working in us. Lord, we thank you that you, the triune God, are a God that loves to hear our prayers. We thank you that one day we will be lost in wonder and praise. Lord, we thank you that one day we will join you in the new heavens and the new earth. Lord, we thank you for that hope that we have in Jesus, a hope that we have because of the cross and resurrection. Lord, we thank you that you are love. We thank you that you are a God of love, that you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have have loved one another in all eternity. And that out of the overflow of your love, you created this world. And out of the overflow of your love, you have saved us. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for that love so clearly demonstrated at the cross. And Lord, as we come this morning, some with heavy hearts, some struggling through a difficult week, some perhaps distracted, some perhaps worrying about the future, others perhaps having enjoyed a good week, a good week of sunshine, Lord. whatever, Whatever week we've had, Lord, we pray that you would focus our thoughts and our hearts and our affections upon you this morning. Lord, help us to look to you. Speak to us through the power of your spirit. Show us more of your truth through your words. Forgive us for the fact that we are sinners. And Lord, we thank you that Christ has saved us from our sin if we have trusted in him as our Lord and Savior. Lord, we pray this in Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. Sometimes it is good to uh, say a confession of our sin together publicly. Uh, So that's what we're going to do now. We're going to speak these words of confession together. So let's uh, say them out loud. Heavenly Father, you are the impartial judge of all people. And you have called us to be holy as you are holy. Forgive us that we easily drift back into an empty way of life. Forgive us that we still conform to evil desires, malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. Thank you that you have redeemed us with the precious blood of Jesus, and you have given us a living hope in him. Please help us to live our lives with reverent fear. Help us to love one another deeply from the heart, and help us to grow up in our salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's read some more of Scripture. A wonderful passage in in Zechariah chapter 3. These wonderful verses uh, we read, Then he showed me Joshua the high priest. So Zechariah, at the beginning of Zechariah, there's a number of visions uh, that, that Zechariah has shown, and, and this, is a, this is another vision that he's seeing, and, and, and God is showing him, and, and so we, we read in verse 1, Then he, that is God, showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, See, I have, give, I have taken away your sin, and I will put fine garments on you. Then I said, Put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. It's a a wonderful picture of the reality of our sin. As we'll see, our sin is is something that is filthy. 
And it requires God, for God really to take away our sin and put on a holy garment. And in reality, that can only be done through Christ dying on the cross for our sins and giving us his righteousness, his holiness, so that one day we can stand before the throne of grace. What a wonderful, a wonderful thought, what a wonderful reality. We'll pick up that, that theme later on as we, we look at Jude. Um, but before we, before we um, have the kids talk and before our reading in Jude, let's sing again, shall we? Uh, let's sing as a result of what we've just read, let us sing with thankfulness. My heart is filled with thankfulness. Uh, for the children's talk now, we have these colourful little chairs that you can come and you can sit on, and Hannah is going to do the talk this morning. Are we okay? For... Hi everyone, it's lovely to see you all. Now, this morning, guess what I've got? Oh, I've had a letter. Oh, did any of you get envelopes like this this morning? Yeah, I think some of you have got all letters like this as well. And what was on the front of your letter? Did it have a, a Sophie? Yeah, you got letters with your names on them, didn't you? Well, this is a letter and it's got a name on and the name says Jude. But instead of Jude being the person who gets the letter, Jude is actually the person who wrote the letter. Jude and his letter, we find his letter in the Bible, in the New Testament, okay? And Jude was actually one of Jesus' half-brothers and he wrote a letter to the churches that he wanted them to, okay? So should we have a look, see what he's written? He says, oh, I've got some important things you need to remember. Oh, Jude says, I'm writing to you because there are some really important things you need 
to remember. Right, so just keep that in your heads for a minute. But I think over this last week, some of you have done some new things, haven't you? Has anywhere been any, anyone been anywhere new this week? Yeah. Where have you been? Where have you been that was new? No, that's not new. <laughs> Cake and Ray's lovely, but it's not new, yeah? Where did you go on Friday? Sophie and Ezra go to nursery on Friday. That was new. Sometimes when we do new things, they can be a bit scary, can't they? We can be a bit like, oh, what's going to happen? I've not done this before. It's a bit scary. Right. Can anybody think of anything else that might be a little bit scary? Mummy. Mummy. <laughs> well, yes. That might be. <laughs> oh, you've changed your mind. Okay. Well, what do you think I might have in my bag that some people might find a bit scary? <gasps> There's a snake. <laughs> Yes. Ah, some people don't like snakes, do they? They go hiss, and they can bite you. Oh, they're a bit scary. Oh no! Now, what else do you think I might have in my bag that might be a bit scary? What else are people scared of? Sharks. That would be a good one to have. I don't have the. Oh, dinosaurs. I think if I was alive when the dinosaurs were, I'd be a bit scared. Yep. Yeah. Well, some people really don't like these, do they? <gasps> spider. spider, creepy crawly. What would you do if you saw a spider above your bed? Ah! ah! Yeah, you know, we don't like spiders. Oh, what about this one? This one's not an animal, but sometimes we might have to go to the doctors and have some medicine or have something put in our arms, some special medicine to keep us from getting poorly. Sometimes we can find that a bit scary because we might not like the taste or it might be a bit sore. We can find that a bit scary, can't we? Now this last one, I haven't, I haven't been able to get the real thing, but I've got, I've got a, a potato. It's, no, it's not a real shark. <laughs> we had some of this last night. If you were up very late, you might have seen some of this. See? <gasps> It's like, yeah, lightning flashes. Uh, who likes who likes lightning? Not me. Not you. Who's scared by lightning? Yeah, lightning can be scary, can't it? Lots of things that we Mama, find scary. Mama, real lightning. Yeah, real lightning can be scary, can't it? We right, lightning. we did. What do you think the Bible says is the scariest thing? What do you think the Bible says is the scariest thing, Mr. Jonathan? The Bible says that sin is the scariest thing. Sin is the scariest thing. Scarier than snakes and spiders and jabs and lightning. Sin is really, really scary, but... We have to know what sin is before we can know why it's scary. And it's a word that we use all the time in the Bible, isn't it? We hear it all the time. Sin. What is sin? Well, sin is spelt with three letters. S -I -N. So those three letters, they can help us remember what sin is. Sin means, you're watching because you're going to do this next. Sin means shove off God. I'm in charge. No to your rules. You remember that? Shove off God, I'm in charge, no to your rules. Yeah. Right, yeah. can you do that with me? You know what we're going to say? Shove off God, I'm in charge, no to your rules. That's what sin means and it's really serious because God made us, so we're telling God to shove off, to go away, we're not listening to you. That's really, really bad. If we're saying, I'm in charge, not God, we're saying, God, I don't care that you made me. I don't care that you're the great king. I want to be king or queen myself. I'm going to make my own rules. And that means we're saying no to God's rules. God's the one in charge. He's given us the rules for how we can live for him. And if we're saying no to his rules, then we're disobeying him. 
That's really, really bad. So what does sin mean? It means shove off, God. I'm in charge. No to your rules. And that's really scary and really serious. The Bible says it's really scary and really serious because sin separates us from God. It means we can't be his friend. We can't be with God. We can't enjoy God and all the good things that he gives you. It's really, really scary. So what would happen if you came across a huge spider in your bedroom and you were really scared? What would you do? Would you go and get mummy or daddy yeah. to come and deal with the spider? Would you say, I don't want to sleep in this Mama. bedroom with that spider in here? Mama. Yeah. Spider. Well, it would usually be daddy, wouldn't it? Come and take the spider yeah. away. We don't want to have to sleep with a spider in this room. Mama. What about if you're Mama. scared of the dark? Mama. What might you do if you're scared of the dark to help you? Mama. You might turn a light on. You might have a little night light or something like that. So you don't have to be scared of the dark. Well, what about sin? If we've really understood that our sin is really scary, when we say no to God and his rules, that's really scary, what can we do about it? Well, the answer is that we can't do anything about it. Sin is inside all of us. We can't fix that problem. But the amazing thing is that we can go and look at Jesus. And when Jesus died on the cross, he took the punishment that all our sin deserves. So when we realize how scary our sin is, we can go to Jesus, we can talk to him, we can say, Jesus, I'm sorry. Please, will you forgive me? Please, will you take the punishment that my sin deserves? So maybe someday this week, you'll have a moment when you realize, oh, I wasn't doing what was right then. I was telling God to shove off. I was doing my own thing and saying no to God's rules. Maybe you'll think, oh, that was really bad. Actually, the Bible doesn't just say it's bad. It's really scary. And when we realize that we've got sin in our hearts, what we need to do is look to Jesus to say sorry and to ask him to forgive us and help us. So that's the first thing that Jude says is really important. The really important things we need to remember, Jude says in his letter, number one, sin is scary. Okay, don't mess around with sin. Don't think sin doesn't matter, but see your sin and go to Jesus. Great. Thank you very much for listening. You can all go back to your seats now. Our reading is from the book of Jude. Um, if you don't know where that is, it's the second last book in the Bible. So if you want to turn it up, um, start at the back and work uh, your way forward. There's only one chapter and we're starting to read at verse 17. Jude 17. Jude says, But dear friends, Remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times, there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith, and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy, mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh.
Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Hannah. And before we look at that passage together, before the children leave for Bible Explorers, uh, we're going to sing again, Who is Lord of the Church? Well, it's the Lord, isn't it? It's not us. So we're going to sing, Lord of the Church, we pray for our renewing Christ over all, our undivided day. And let's pray this as we sing it, as we uh, uh, prepare to listen to God's word and hear God's word. Uh, let us come and let us sing now to the praise and glory of Christ. like to go to classes, Bible Explorers, as the children are doing that. If you could have your Bible open at Jude, that would be helpful. Uh, we're in our second part two of a three-part series. Last week, we looked at verses 1 to 16 in our series, Keep the Faith, and we saw the importance in keeping the faith of the needing to contend for the faith, especially against false teachers. 
which is uh, why we, we, we looked at the, the seriousness of sin and the reality that sin brings judgment. That's what we looked at last week. But this week we're looking at Jude uh, 17 to 23. It's part two. Before we do, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for your word. We thank you for the truths in your word. We thank you for this short letter of Jude. Lord, may it equip us now. May it help us now to see more of your truth and to live it out. Lord, help us by the power of your spirit. Help me to be faithful and clear. And would your name be glorified. Amen. Uh, Nims Perja, I think that's how you pronounce his name, is a Nepalese mountaineer and an ex Gurkha and SBS soldier. Uh, in 2019, he did what was thought impossible. He climbed all 14 of the highest mountains in the Himalayas in just over six months. His ability uh, to keep going, there's a documentary on Netflix, if you want to watch it, it is great. His ability to keep going, his training, his determination is amazing. In fact, at one point, he had, I think, one last mountain to climb, but the Chinese had closed the mountain. <laughs> Frustrated that, you, get, you have the 13 and then the Chinese close the mountain. But, but he, he managed to campaign, he managed to, uh, to talk to the Chinese, and, and they opened the mountain just for him. So that he could climb it, his determination, his desire to never give up is quite impressive. And sometimes uh, faith feels like climbing a mountain, doesn't it? The ups and downs of life, the ascending and the descending, the ascending and the descending. It's hard and it, and it, becomes a, uh, it comes with real challenges, doesn't it? Even sometimes tragedies. And there's always another mountain to climb. But a bit like Nim's accomplishments, Jude teaches us to never give up. To never give up. To never stop trusting in Jesus as Lord and Savior. To, to persevere. So we've had last week contend as we keep the faith. This week, persevere. And we see that really in verse 21. Jude commands his readers and us, keep yourselves in God's love. Keep walking in the faith to, to not give up, to, to keep the faith, to keep trusting in Jesus. Don't give up. But how do we do this? Well, we'll see next week that sovereignly in verse 24, Jesus is able to keep us from stumbling which is an amazing truth, but we're going to look at that next week. But this week, we, we see that it's our responsibility in this passage to keep ourselves in God's love. And Jude offers six helpful things we need to do in order to keep ourselves in God's love. So you're ready this morning, six helpful things to persevere. How do we keep ourselves in God's love? Well, firstly, Jude says, by remembering what the apostles taught. Uh, verses 17 to 19. You see, Jude is he's directing his readers as he wants them to persevere, to remember the writings of the apostles. You could, you could stretch that out further, I, I think, to say, just remember the scriptures. And you see this in verse 17. He says, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. Remember. Uh, I wonder if when Jude writes then in verse 15, 18, they said to you in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. Whether anybody at the time or later, and they certainly did, thought, well, this sounds a bit like the Apostle Peter in 2 Peter 3.3. 3, when he wrote, above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers, same word, will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. You see, the apostles predicted this. And Jude says, remember what the apostles taught, plural. He's not just thinking of one apostle. You can read the New Testament, you can read Paul, you can read Peter, and you see the reality that, that, that false teaching is going to come. Here's the thing uh, Jude wants us to remember. The more we remember the apostles' writings, you can say the more we know Scripture the less surprised we'll be when false teaching or anything happens that rocks our foundations and causes us to doubt. 
Do we know what Paul taught? Do we know what Peter taught? Do we know what John taught? Or by extension, do we know what Luke? Um, do we know what uh, Matthew taught? Uh, do we know what the Old Testament writers taught? You see, the more we get stuck into the Bible, the more we remember, and, and that word remember isn't just a mental exercise, by the way. It means something like you take it to heart and you live it out. Are we remembering? Are we taking it to heart and living out the apostles' teaching? The more we do this, the more we will keep ourselves in God's love. The more we will persevere. And of course, when you remember, when you, you realize the, the importance of the apostles' teaching and the truths of the apostles' teaching, you, you'll know that false teaching brings division, as Jude says in verse 19, and in fact, that these false teachers aren't actually Christians because they don't have the spirits dwelling and working in them. Keep yourselves in God's love. But number two is uh, just as important because Jude goes on to say, well, how do we keep ourselves in God's love? By building ourselves up in the gospel. Uh, there's been plenty of stuff on the news recently about schools struggling to open on time uh, because they don't have the right kind of concrete. In fact, even uh, Dewsbury Sports Center is closed. That's a really sad uh, that that's had to close. And it's, it's, it's because of this concrete, and I, I don't really know much about it. I'm not a structural engineer. Uh, but apparently one news, newspaper said, and uh, you know, whether, it, whether it's true or not, this, this concrete has 80% air in it. I think I heard it called aero concrete, <laughs> bubbly concrete. Now, I'm, I'm not a builder, as I said, <laughs> far from it. Um, but in my head, if you build something with 80% air in it and build something on top of that, it sounds like a recipe for disaster. Well, if you want to take that metaphor, what materials we use to build our faith with will determine how strong our faith is. You hear that? What materials we use our, to build our faith with will, deter, will determine how strong our faith is. And Jude says in verse 20, we have one material we use and we keep on using. Because how we keep ourselves in God's love is dependent on us doing this. You see what he says? By building yourselves up in your most holy faith. We, we learned last week in verse 3 that, that when Jude talks about faith here, he's talking about the content of our belief. So he's referring to the gospel. The one thing we need to keep building, to keep growing, to keep getting stronger, to keep ourselves in God's love, is to keep going back to the gospel again and again and again and again. To keep, you could say, actively preaching the gospel to yourself. The gospel, which is the good news that reveals God's glorious salvation. His salvation plan in Jesus who came to live the sinless life you could not live and die on the cross for your sins and rise from the grave to defeat the change of sin, Satan, and death that enslave us all so we might be saved by grace into God's kingdom. It is wonderful news. It's why we call it good news. And it's what every human being needs. So if you're not a Christian here this morning, this is what you need. You need the gospel. You need Jesus. You need to turn from your sins and trust in him as your Lord and Savior. But get this, if you're a Christian here this morning, you need the gospel. You need to trust in Jesus and keep coming back to Jesus and remembering what he has done for us. And it's tempting, isn't it, uh, that once we're saved, we, we like to add to the gospel sometimes. So, yeah, we might think, oh, let's, let's use some different materials. The gospel's got us in. Let's use some different materials to build on now to, to keep us in the faith. So uh, I'd l let's use some good works. I'll, I'll build on, on, my, on, on, on everything that, I've, that God has done by, by b building with good works, which is not a bad thing, but it, it's not a good thing when it comes to building yourself and keeping yourself in Christ. Or what about we might build on uh, our own reputation? 
Oh, yeah, my reputation's important. I'll rely on my reputation. Or we might use materials like our own feelings. Yeah, my own feelings will determine actually whether I'm in God's love or not. But actually, that's, that's a, not a good thing because our feelings go up and down. Or we might use, oh, our experience of God, which again is a lovely thing. But, but if you use your experience of God, then what happens when you don't feel like you've experienced God? It's not a good thing to keep yourself in God's love. What we need to keep ourselves in God's love is the gospel. Keep preaching the gospel to yourselves. Every day, every time we feel like slipping, every time we are down, every time we forget, every time we are doubting, every time we are jealous of what our friends get up to, every time we feel like giving up, every time we are tempted to sin, what do we do? We preach the gospel to ourselves. Uh, Milton Vincent has written a book. Uh, you won't have heard who he is, but uh, he's written a book, uh, unlike any other book on the gospel, uh, called The Glories of God's Love, a gospel primer for Christians. And he's basically written down what he's been doing for years, preaching the gospel to himself by looking at different angles of the gospel or how the gospel applies to different aspects of his life. And here's one example of, of how he, he, he does this. He says, The gospel is so foolish according to my natural wisdom, so scandalous according to my conscience, and so incredible according to my timid heart, that it is a daily battle to believe the full scope of it as I should. There is simply no other way to compete with the forebodings of my conscience, the condemnings of my heart, and the lies of the world and the devil than to overwhelm such things with daily rehearsings of the gospel. And this is one of his daily rehearsings of the gospel, one of his little summaries. He says, for example, Jesus loved me so much that he was willing to lay down his life for me. No one could ever love me more or better than Jesus. Keep preaching the gospel yourselves what are we using to build yourself up can i tell yourself that strength a strength of a christian you can tell a strength of a christian by how well they build themselves up with the gospel or i should say how well we've been built up with the gospel as we disciple one another because this is not a single activity an individual activity it's a church activity keep yourselves in god's love Thirdly, though, Jude goes on and he says, uh, praying in the Spirit is the third thing that we need. Verse 20, because that's what Jude says next after encourages to build ourselves up in the most holy faith. He says then, and praying in the Holy Spirit. Um, one of the wonderful implications of that building metaphor is knowing what we are building. You know what we're building? Well, many believe Jude is referring to the fact that as Christians, as God's church, we are his temple. And we are building his temple, the place where God dwells in his presence. And he is present in our lives as Christians because the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, dwells within us. Now that is a staggering claim. If you're not a Christian here this morning, that might sound like a, an outrageous claim. But this staggering reality means that one of the applications of this is that we can have help to do something pretty much all Christians universally struggle to do, pray. Jude says, pray in the Spirit, which is a way of saying, rely on the Spirit in prayer. Be in harmony with the Spirit in prayer, so your agenda is, is not... Uh, the dominant agenda, that God's agenda is the dominant agenda in your life. Jude says, pray in the Spirit, which is a way of, of really saying, rely on the Spirit in prayer. See, prayer is a vital ingredient to perseverance because it's showing dependence on God. Every time we pray, we're, we're coming depending upon God. It shows we, we actually we have a spiritual pulse that beats for God. Um, there was a book written uh, a few years ago by, by Mike Reeves, and he, and he said this, that's always stuck with me, prayerlessness is practical atheism. That if, if we don't pray, then we're living as if we don't trust believing God. When we pray, we're depending upon God. We're seeking Him. And it shows, doesn't it, the healthiness of our relationship with God Himself. I mean, relationships are very much dependent on communication, aren't they? I don't know, you know, you know, your various relationships. 
you communicate, don't you? I hope you do. Um, I, hope, I hope you're not giving anybody the silent treatment right now. Because uh, it, it's important, isn't it? And, and what you, how often you speak to someone and what you say to that person will de depend on how that relationship is going. How much you're willing to trust that person with. Do we come daily with the Spirit's help seeking God in prayer? Keep yourselves in God's love by praying often, by praying daily. Fourthly, though, we need to move on because Jude continues by saying, how do we keep ourselves in God's love? By waiting for Christ's return, verse 21. I remember going to the cinema back in 2001. Uh, what came out in December 2001? Lord of the Rings. And not Harry Potter. Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship of the Ring. And I loved it. Uh, I loved it so much I went to see it twice again at the cinema. The first time I went to see it at the cinema, I made a bad mistake. Well, actually, there was about a dozen of us. We made a bad mistake. We went at 1 a.m. in the morning. Uh, now the film is over three hours long. Uh, I was tired for a few days. Uh, but I knew that there would be two more films. Uh, I knew, as much as I loved this film, there would be two more films. But I also knew that they wouldn't come out next month. I also knew they wouldn't come out in six months. No, I would have to wait. I would have to wait one more year for the second film and two more years for the third film. We're not always that good at waiting, are we? Are we? Whether that's waiting in a traffic jam or waiting for tea to be cooked, or fellowship lunch. <laughs> but here Jude tells us to wait in verse 21, doesn't he? Just look at it. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Wait, wait, and wait some more for Christ to come. Wait for our merciful Savior so you can experience what is a reality now, but you can experience it in full, eternal life with Christ forever. Is this, uh, is this something we're waiting for? Is this something we're eagerly anticipating like Christmas or our next holiday? We get excited about those things, don't we? Well, some of us do. I suspect for most of us, it's barely on our radar, uh, but it's a key ingredient to, of persevering. It is to wait for the hope and wonderful reality of Jesus Christ coming back, to wait for the return of the King. In fact, the word waiting here evokes the idea of eager and patient expectations. Are we eager? Are we patient? I was speaking to the, the, the young lads last Sunday. We were doing a Bible study. And I said, one of my friends, we were talking about uh, Christ coming back. And one of my friends was dead honest. He said, I don't want Christ to come back soon because I've got lots of things I want to do. And, and you know what? That's probably the truth in most of our hearts. But do we, are we actually eager? Are we actually longing? Are we actually desiring for Christ? to return, to be waiting and longing for Christ to come back. And here's why we should be eager, because when Christ returns, all suffering, all evil, all pain, all tears, all death will be no more. Every evil act will be judged, justice will be done, and we will spend eternity in the glorious presence of our holy gods. If you're struggling this morning and you feel like giving up, be patient. Keep waiting. Don't give up. And wait for the hope of Christ's return. And if this isn't on your radar, well, if you keep preaching the gospel to yourself daily, it will be because part of the gospel is preaching the reality to yourself that one day Christ will return. Uh, the Nicene Creed is a statement of Christian truth recited by Christians since the 4th century. Do you know what the last sentence of this amazing body of truth says? We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Are we looking? Are we waiting? Keep yourselves in God's love. So we've seen four things. We've seen the need to remember the apostles taught, what the apostles taught. We've seen that we need to build ourselves up in the gospel. We've seen that we need to be praying in the spirit. We've seen that we need to be waiting for Christ's return. Now, fifthly, we need to also see in verses 22 to 23, the need to keep ourselves in God's love by loving, struggling believers. Because being a Christian is not a lone ranger affair. If you attempt to live your Christian life on your own in isolation, don't do it. Come to church. Serve in church. Be part of a Christian community. Because it's about loving and helping those. Part of the, the church is about loving and helping those that are struggling, reminding them about our first four points, yes, but actually just being there and showing mercy and love. And Jesus says we do this to three types of strugglers here. And the first is people doubting the faith. He says, doesn't he, verse 22, he says, be merciful to those who doubt. Now, sometimes as Christians, we can be quite harsh to those who are doubting. Uh, why are you struggling? Just, you know, get on with it, believe. And sometimes we can be, we can, uh, that people doubting can, can feel that they're judged. People doubting can feel that they're less of a Christian, that they shouldn't be going through doubts. Uh, and, and, and the way that we uh, um, interact with them can, cannot be very helpful at sometimes. It can be quite judgmental. But Jude says, be judgmental to those who doubt. He doesn't say that, does he? He says, be merciful. You know, it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to ask questions. It's not always sinful to doubt. There's lots of different ways of, of doubting, and we should never push people away who come to us with difficult questions who are struggling with their faith. Jude says, be merciful to them. It's the same word to describe the coming of Jesus in verse 21, the mercy of Jesus. You see, to doubting believers, we need to be Jesus-like. Show love and care and compassion. Show mercy to these people who are doubting. Uh, the second type of person is, I think, somebody in a lot more danger, uh, people departing the faith. Because Jude says, save others, so there's a second category here, by snatching them from the fire. Now, those who have been swayed by the false teaching or perhaps by the ways of this world, we need to do all we can from stopping them from leaving because by leaving, they are, they are leaving themselves open to God's judgment, aren't they? I mean, what does fire mean? It's, it's God's judgment. So we need to be contending with these people. We need to be putting into practice points one and four so we're ready to catch these people like a, a catching a stick from a fire before... They fall and do irreparable damage to their soul. And finally, there's uh, people not living the faith. Because uh, those who, you could say, whose lifestyle no longer follow the pattern of Christ, as Jude says, he, he says, doesn't he then, uh, in this, he says, in verse 23, uh, to others, so a third category, show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. In context to Jude, who earlier on talks about immorality, he's probably thinking, especially with the idea of hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh, the reality of somebody sinning in a sexual way. Probably people who have perverted the grace of God as a license to live how they want. And you know what Jude says? We should love these people. Again, it's not we should judge these people. We should love these people. Show mercy, Jude says. It's so easy to quickly judge them. But we should show love. Are you one of these three types of people here this morning? Are you doubting? Are you departing? Are you living in a way that is, it is not uh, living for Christ? Let us help you. Speak to us. Let us love you. Keep yourselves in God's love by loving God's people. And then finally, how do we keep ourselves in God's love? By hating sin. That's the end of verse 23. Hating sin. Because Jude finishes by saying, hating even the clothing stained 
by corrupted flesh. So, so as we show mercy mixed with fear to people living a life of sin, we should never love the sin. I mean, this is strong language, isn't it? Hating the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. That word stained ain't a word for a tomato ketchup stain on your t-shirt. It's a word to describe feces on your clothes. What belongs to the toilet stains your clothes. That's the imagery of sin that we have, that we should have in our heads. Now, if we viewed sin like that, we'd hate it, wouldn't we? More. And we do everything to take it off, to, to put on a clean shirt, to do what, what Matt looked at last Sunday evening in Colossians 3, to put to death and, and, uh, our, our, our sin and to put on Christ. Uh, Jude taught us last week that some people don't just tolerate sin, but say sin is good and okay to do. It's okay. It's okay to have sex with whoever you want. It's okay to lose your temper. It's okay to look at porn. It's okay to lie and cheat and to gossip about someone. But Jude said last week, as we saw, it's not okay. Why do we see it's not okay here? Because Jude says they are all stained with something you can't get off. So how do we hate sin? How do we hate sin? Well, earlier on in the service, we read a passage from Zechariah chapter 3, didn't we? Of this high priest Joshua being accused by Satan because he wore filthy clothing, clothes stained by sin. And in, in it, the angel of the Lord said to those standing by uh, Joshua, take off his filthy clothes. And then he says, see, I've taken away your sin, put fine garments on you. It's, it's a passage anticipating the gospel. The good news that we're all snatched from the fire and that another Joshua, another high priest came who has never been stained by sin, Jesus, and he is the one who has taken away our sin and we are clothed with his holiness, with his righteousness, his spotless record. So when Christ returns, he won't see stained sinners, he'll see his own holy people. So we hate sin when we look to Christ and his holiness. When we love Christ and want what he gives us, his clothes of righteousness, his pure spotless garment, him. And then, as we see Jesus, we'll see sin as it is. Smelly, horrible, polluted excrement. Not fit to touch or even go close to. But that ain't easy, is it? I mean, that doesn't happen every day for us. And it can lead us to giving up on God's love, which is why we need to keep ourselves in God's love by remembering what the apostles taught, by building ourselves up in the gospel, by praying in the spirit, by waiting for Christ's return, and by loving, struggling believers. And if we do this, then we'll hate sin. We'll keep ourselves in the love of God. The love that saves us from sin, that rescues us from sin, the love that died for us, the love that sacrifices for us, the love of Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing in response. We've been looking at this passage, it's, it's, the emphasis is on us. Uh, but it's, it's important to, to get the balance right. And so as we've looked at the emphasis of us keeping ourselves in God's love, it's, it's good as well to remember the throne of grace and the faithfulness of God. So we're going to sing, Lord, I come before your throne of grace. Let us stand and sing together.
I just say one of the one of the ways you can preach the gospel to yourself is sing the gospel. That's uh, perhaps a, even a more effective way sometimes. Uh, for those uh, who have joined us uh, on catch up, that's the end of the service. Thank you for for joining us.